I was seeing all of these really big ad campaigns promoting things that are not great for us, like tobacco, oil and gas, fast fashion. I was seeing all of these really disastrous industries and lies getting really huge platforms on social media and the internet. And I was like, that's not cool. And the fact that so many marketing dollars and campaigns and budgets are going behind some of the most vicious planet destructive industries in the world. I was like, well, I need to do my part and create my own thing because I feel really frustrated about that. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Inner Wealth, the Forbes Ignite podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Kakal, CEO of Forbes Ignite. And every week I'll be sharing with you my conversations with unique, creative, and innovative people across all different industries. These are people who are intellectually curious explorers who are also redefining what it means to be successful today. From personal to professional, we cover it all to understand what drives our guests to blaze their own trails and create nimble solutions within the industries that touch each of our lives. Our guest today is Christy Drutman, founder and creator of Brown Girl Green, a multimedia series and platform where she features environmental leaders and advocates who discuss the importance of diversity and inclusion, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. She is also co-founder of the Green Jobs Board, a platform that connects people to environmental jobs and gives resources to the sustainability community. We talk about addressing bridging the gaps in the environmental sector, showing up authentically in entrepreneurship, and diversity and inclusion in the environmental movement. I know you're going to love what she has to say. Here's our chat. Hey, Christy, how's it going? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. So it's been a little bit since we last spoke, but I have been looking forward to this conversation for so long because it's so nice meeting another Filipina in the space. And there's just There's not a lot of us, so I feel like we got to stick together. (laughs) Oh, 100%, 100%. I think especially in the entrepreneurship world and and forging your own path that is, you know, less traditional, it it can be really isolating at times. So I think, you know, you even having this platform and creating the space for these kinds of conversations is already empowering as it is. So I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be speaking with you because I know you wear lots of different hats and you do a lot of incredible work. And so I know you have a full plate with traveling around, being out of the country and finally being back on the East Coast now. So tell me, what have you been up to lately? Yeah, so... You know, I work on environmental media. And so a lot of my work is related to content and issue areas related to climate change, environmental advocacy. And so I was actually just in Cambodia this past May to begin what I hope to be a more full fledged docuseries on sustainable fashion in Southeast Asia, specifically focusing on artists and makers based in Cambodia who are basically upcycling textile waste to make higher fashion clothing. And basically, I was there to do some storytelling with the actual makers themselves to start exploring our relationship with clothes and the things we own. And that's just like one case study of the many stories that I tell on my platform, Brown Girl Green, where I'm really focused on finding and sourcing stories from people from around the world that I think are coming up with amazing solutions to address the environmental issues of our time. And I think storytelling is so powerful in that. Like, yeah, so I was in Asia and I was working on that project. I am currently based on the East Coast and the New York City area. And so constantly looking for local initiatives, food collectives, environmental justice organizations, and finding people who reach out to me from around the world. And yeah, that's basically what I've been up to. (laughs) That sounds really exciting. So before we dive into all the amazing storytelling and all of the different work and initiatives you've done with the people that you've met in the space, tell us what was your personal and professional journey to where you are today? Uh, Yeah, so my personal and professional journey started with my work at university. I went to UC Berkeley and I studied environmental policy and urban planning. I really wanted to get into the sustainability sector because I felt like that was a, a category or an issue area where I felt like I could make change and really address issues around human rights, thinking about justice issues happening in the world. And as I dove deeper into it and got involved in youth environmental activism at UC Berkeley, that really showed me the scale of the crisis when it comes to climate change and how much needs to be done about it. I would say towards the end of college, I realized that I didn't really want to go to law school anymore, which is what I had originally wanted to do when I started out at university. 
And I realized I didn't really even want to go the public policy route. But I realized that there was a lot of gaps in needing to shift this industry and shift the ways in which we were talking about the environment on a much larger scale. And for me, I realized the way to do that is through media and marketing. That is why I created my platform, Brown Girl Green, which started off as a podcast and then has now evolved into a multimedia series where I'm basically trying to educate people about a wide range of different topics related to environmental advocacy, ways people can take action, as well as companies that I believe are doing actually good things in the world to protect and preserve the environment. And so my company and business is centered around that. And one of the services that we just launched this past year is our Green Jobs Board, which is also a social media platform and career recruiting service that basically is using social media as a way to recruit people into green jobs. And so, yeah, I just would say my career journey was all very self-built. It was all through mentorship and a lot of the relationships and connections that I had to be able to basically create my own job. And it was a lot of just learning and curiosity along the way while also having an academic background and expertise in this area and just finding the gap. And my gap or the, the problem area I was trying to fix, as many entrepreneurs are trying to fix, was the storytelling piece I was seeing in this space and how much of a culture shift I felt was necessary in order for the climate movement at large to keep moving forward. That is amazing. And you're doing a lot of incredible work in this space. And what I love and what I think is so wonderful is that your journey started way back when in university. So what have you seen? I'm just really curious. What have you seen are some differences between what you experienced when you were going through university and now, and what would you give current university students as advice? I would say that there's a lot more opportunities, to be honest with you. There's actually better paying jobs now in the environmental sector that did not exist. When I was in college, like back when I was in university only a couple of years ago, most of the well-paying jobs, you either had to be in engineering or you had to be in like conservation work, very niche research. I mean, even that wasn't really that well-paid. I'm being generous by saying that's well-paid. <laughs> I'm just saying like you had to kind of go through some back doors to find a good paying job or find an opportunity and yeah, like I'm not saying the environmental field is like paying what like the tech sector or like, or like, let's not go so far there. But like, there's at least, you know, paying people what they deserve kind of wages. And there's definitely more rules opening and more funding opportunities for initiatives and projects than I've ever seen before for people to get into the sustainability sector or to green their job or their, their profession if they're not originally an environmental position, but like they want to incorporate that in. There's so much more funding and certification that exists now to do that that just didn't exist a couple years ago. So I'd say that there's so many more avenues and funding and incubators and things like that, especially young people can plug into that I didn't get access to when I was doing this work, especially when it comes to communications and marketing. Those jobs just did not exist a couple years ago. And now you see social media, digital media strategists, marketers in the environmental field. And I can straight up tell you those jobs were non-existent even five years ago, for sure. But it's people like you, especially those who are working to spread the word about more environmental jobs, more sustainable jobs, generally more green jobs by creating the Green Jobs Board. So tell us more about that. For a long time, this was festering in my mind that I wanted Brown Girl Green to be more of a mentorship platform that wouldn't just be about content, it would be about bridging opportunities. So I started putting some job postings as like a content post. And I made these little graphics advertising. These are jobs that I just found on the internet. And I was like, I'm just going to do this once a week and just see what happens. And I honestly didn't think it was going to get that much attention. It blew up. It was getting some of the best engagement I was getting on any posts for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it got to the point towards the end of last year where people were saying, we want you to make this its own thing. And I was like, oh, interesting. And so then I started talking to my team at Brown Girl Green about it. And we're like, yeah, why don't we just launch it as its own separate platform and just see what happens? So we launched it in March of 2022. And only a few months later, we've pretty much reached 10,000 followers. And not only that, we're actually generating revenue from it. We're actually like building an audience and building a community that's not only just thinking about 
getting a green job, but thinking about what is their long-term career goal and how are certain companies and organizations meeting the task to meet this upcoming workforce. And I think that we're actively using social media as a way to change the culture around what work in this field can look like, because a lot of people don't even know how to start, especially if maybe you have a degree in something that has nothing to do with environmental stuff. How do you even switch into the environmental sector? How do we move people who maybe have technical skills, but don't know how to apply that to an environmental job. So it's not like we're just posting jobs. We also want to like help people understand and give resources about that. Bring in thought leadership, experts. We want to just become this valuable resource to the community to make these opportunities way more accessible to more people, because that is what we really need if we're going to expand the green economy, if we're going to show governments and companies that this is something people want, then people need to have opportunities to do that. And I was like, well, you know, I want to, again, be that bridge and and try to address that gap as well. That's incredible. And it's so hard to believe that it was just launched. I know that you had started working on it last year, but it was officially launched in March of this year. So congratulations on all that growth. It's just a testament to how much demand there is, because there's two really important things that I took from what you just said. One is the community building aspect. People are starved for community in the space. And it's not just about posting jobs and leaving them to their devices. It's all about mentorship. It's about bridging the gaps. And the second important thing is the exposure. There's that saying that if you don't know what you don't know, how on earth are you going to imagine being in a uh, environmental job when you, when you grow up, so to speak? So a lot of people need more exposure to those types of roles and types of functions so that they can better see themselves in the movement. So I think that's really important. Yeah, exactly. Like for me, I had to navigate all of this on my own. And I remember going to career counselors, going to talk to mentors, and like I was having breakdowns. I was so anxious. I was so hopeless. I was like, I can't build a career in this field. Why did I major in this? I wasted all this you know, money and resources. What am I doing? Even though this is what I'm passionate about. And no one should have to feel that way, especially for a sector that is going to be so necessary for the fate of humanity. There needs to be a shift in our narrative and perspective on it. So for me, I'm like, if I can make things easier for someone else, then that's a win for me, for sure. That's so admirable. And I know you mentioned throughout these past couple of years, you've had the opportunity and the privilege to be mentored and to give back and have that more of like a two-way street. So tell us, who are some of your role models who have inspired you? Yeah, I just want to shout out my mentor, Marcelo Vanta. He's also a Filipino and he's amazing. And he's done so much work on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the environmental space. He's been a huge mentor to me to thinking about diversity and inclusion and who gets a seat at the table. And I would definitely say my parents, very typical answer, but I would say that like they always help remind me to ground myself and to not get so lost in the weeds of everything. I think a lot of the work I do is so fast paced that sometimes I forget to take care of myself because it can all just happen so quickly. So my parents have been really encouraging of things I can do for like self care and making sure I'm also grounding myself along the way. And yeah, I would say like my last role model that really has inspired me is definitely Dr. Robert Bullard. He's the father of the environmental justice movement. A lot of his work was just so deep and intentional and laid a lot of the groundwork for the work that I and other young people who are advocating for environmental justice are doing now. And so I think everything that he has done to lay this groundwork continues to ground and and guide my principles. Those are some excellent role models. And yes, although saying that your parents is a typical answer, it's not cliche at all. I feel like we derive a lot of our values from our parents. And so it really transpires into our work. So I think that's really important. And I'm glad that you call that out. (laughs) Yeah. And so what are some of the initiatives that you're most proud of? I know you mentioned and touched a little bit upon the project that you're working on in Cambodia, but what are some other stories that you'd like to tell? Yeah, I would say another initiative that I'm just really excited about is the Brown Girl Green podcast. It's kind of had its ups and downs of, you know, just capacity and bringing people on. But a lot of that has been 
highlighting specifically Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities and leaders who are doing really incredible work around climate solutions. A lot of it's about passing the mic from my platform to them and being able to share and co-create stories and episodes to talk about that. So I always get really excited to plug the podcast specifically because it's really the space where I try to also meet incredible people that know things that I have no idea about to educate me along the way and make me an even better environmental advocate and to share that information accessibly with wider audiences. And the other series that I'm excited about is my Love and Climate Change series. I did this series about sustainable speed dating. So I had different couples go on speed dates. Well, they weren't really couples. They just met each other to talk about what their views were on climate change. And people loved it. And I'm hoping to continue to expand that series again to like make this stuff that feels very intense and depressing a little bit more fun and accessible to educate people. I love that. That's so creative. Thank you. How can our listeners get more involved with Brown Girl Green's mission? For people to get involved with Brown Girl Green's mission, I would say learn about environmental justice initiatives happening in your communities. There's so many nonprofits doing incredible work on the ground in communities all over the world, but especially here in the U.S. So try to look into what environmental justice means, learn what nonprofits and organizations are around, and volunteer your time or reach out to them. A lot of them need more capacity and support and just amplification. So any ways you can support in that way is really critical. I would say definitely for this upcoming election for bipartisan voting, we definitely need people to get out and vote and take action. It's so important. We also need people who can amplify young women of color entrepreneurs like myself who are shifting this space. So I would say that if there's anyone out there who is interested in supporting independent media creation driven by women of color, would love to connect with you. You know, I'm just starting out as an entrepreneur. There's a lot of things that I'm still learning of running my own business that I've just had to teach myself and find amazing people along the way who have believed in my vision to address the climate crisis, but through a very culturally nuanced lens. And so if that speaks to you and you feel aligned with it, I love to connect with you. And that's the best way you can support is sharing your own expertise or resources or knowledge to contribute to this movement of this platform, whether that be you have coding skills or you know people who can code or you know people who have entrepreneurship courses or financial management or accounting. And yeah, you're not in the climate space, but you want to help us out. Like those are all necessary skills, even if you're not a climate person that you could be helping out climate people like me to do. And so I just think people need to reframe their their mindset on what it means to get involved, that a lot of these things require teams, it requires movement, it's never going to be up to one individual. So whatever your skill set is and how you can contribute to a team and a broader movement, that's where I would say that you could best plug in. And if Brown Girl Green is is your way of wanting to do that, then definitely reach out. I love that. I love how you emphasize that regardless of what your skill sets are, you have your own talents to make an impact in your own way. And somebody is going to benefit from that, especially in the climate justice movement, which we all need to come together to be able to solve these really large systemic challenges. And I want to dive more deeply into the business side of Brown Girl Green. So I know we're all just learning about entrepreneurship. I know I am. And so what would you tell yourself, Christy, now? What would you tell yourself, Christy, let's say like two years ago? (laughs) Good question. I would say that you have to have a team. You're not going to do this by yourself. It's impossible, literally impossible. And you need to just figure it out on like how you're going to be able to pay for that. You know what I mean? You have to set goals and know that what you're doing is really working, even though you're doubting yourself and that you have to trust people who offer to help you that they're going to help you. I think before I, I was very like, oh, I don't know. I could just do it all myself. And oh, the past two years especially have taught me that that's not true, that Actually, the people who have worked with me have made my business so much better, It's made it so much more efficient and has operated from so many different perspectives than I never could have imagined because I would have been limited in my own scope. So for me, it was like learning how to put my own pride aside and learning how to ask for help and actually trusting people once I did ask them for help and then actually getting to really soak in their expertise 
even though it's my quote unquote platform or business has been so critical for me because now I feel like I'm not just operating from my vantage point. I'm actually operating from multiple vantage points that allows me to reach even more people and to think about how to fix problems so much more efficiently. Absolutely. We have a lot of listeners who are entrepreneurs who are currently working for corporations and are thinking about branching off on their own or doing their own ventures. So what would you say to listeners who are interested in starting their own social venture? Yeah, I would just say, make sure you know what your why is. I think if you're going to go into this focused on making money, you're going to burn out really fast because a lot of this work is slower. And especially when it's based on relationships and community building, you're not going to rake in all the money all at once. You know what I mean? And that's (laughs) going to be your priority. And if that is your priority, you probably shouldn't be doing this work just because the money is not going to keep you in the work. The money is going to be there. But then like, you know, the difficult conversations, the judgment, the bureaucracy you have to navigate, the money is not going to save you from that. (laughs) So I just think if you go into it with the mindset of, okay, I'm doing this because I want to make a lot of money from it. It's just not going to get you far on multiple accounts. I would say the second part of that is collaborating with people. Again, if you're just going to do it on your own and try to be this little like rocket ship saying, I'm the first person to ever do this, especially in a particular niche, that can be viewed as off-putting to some other people rather than, you know, you actually showing up and trying to build with people and trying to show your own value add in that space. So it's really important to show up authentically with clear intentions and to try to collaborate with people as much as possible, especially when you're starting out and trying to build your thought leadership. And I would say the last part of it that I think is so important is definitely figuring out what grounds you. Again, this kind of work can be really fast paced. It can throw you off your game at times. So you need to also have a good support system in place because there's going to be a lot of highs of highs and a lot of lows of lows. So you have to find out who's your support system going to be. That's even more important than what your business plan is, to be honest with you. That is so true. That's really great and sound advice. And so I know you mentioned that there's a lot of high highs and really low lows. And so can you tell us about a time where you had to overcome an obstacle and what you're most proud of about that? I would say a really big obstacle for me was just getting over my own self-doubt. I mean, it wasn't like a single event. I would say it was it was the beginning of my process. I would say that I had so much quote unquote imposter syndrome when I was first starting this out, that it would prevent me from putting out any piece of content. Like I would make a bunch of stuff and I would save it in drafts and I just wouldn't put it out in the world. I was just so nervous that it wasn't good enough, that it was bad. Like I would just overthink. I would have all this anxiety and spiral. So therefore there's so much stuff that I actually have from years ago that I just never put out. And again, as time went on, because it wasn't really relevant anymore, I couldn't put it out anymore. And that was really hard to reckon with where it was like, oh my gosh, like I feel so bad. But a good friend of mine slash also my mentor, but also my best friend was like, well, even the stuff that goes unpublished or the things that may be imperfect is actually also equally as valid and part of your process. So actually fighting through those feelings of imposter syndrome, maybe not publishing things, maybe making something that never sees the light of day, jotting down notes, doing things that make you want to cringe or you feel like other people are going to cringe watching. That actually is so critical to building your process because it's like you're starting it out ugly. You're making it rough. You're planning to fail in some ways. And from there, you can actually keep building and iterating and getting better. And so for me, I view that as like, really difficult times in my life where, yeah, I would make stuff and just like not put it out. And I would always be so hard on myself and felt so bad. But the way I got through it was remembering that, that like, hey, even if I don't put this out, that just means it's laying the groundwork for something else. And nowadays, I don't even really have that voice as much in my head. Like if I think something's not great, I'm like, whatever, on to the next. Do you know what I mean? And that's how the voice in my head has shifted. Whereas before it was like, I can't even put this out. Now it's like, no, just put it out. It may not, it might not be great. It may not be the best thing you put out, but at least you put it out and then you can do better next time. So it's a different, it's a shift in mindset. Exactly, exactly. I absolutely love that because I think it was Seth Godin that said, 
as an analogy that if he could write every single day, he could. And I think that really speaks to how it's all just part of the process, whether you're writing or producing content, you're creating podcasts, for example, it's just doing it. And it's all part of this process in your body of work. So I learned a lot from what you just said. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to apply that to my own creative process. So thank you for that. And so I asked this question to all of my guests on my podcast. So how do you define success? You know, I define success through the relationships that I'm able to build where people feel seen and heard in this work. So every time I get a message from an organization or an activist in a country that is underrepresented in this space, and they say, because of your platform, I feel like more people got to hear my story or... I hear stories of people getting jobs through the green jobs board in the platform. And they're like, if it wasn't for this platform, I don't even know if I'd be able to pay rent this next month. People who are actually using my content and my platform and my services to build relationships and gain ideas that they never would have before because they didn't have access to it because it's so gatekept. And then being able to channel and use that to benefit themselves and their communities. And it was amazing. I met this woman just a few months ago at an event and I was randomly telling people about my journey and my work. And she came up to me and told me that she wasn't even in the environmental field a couple of years ago, but because she followed my account, she started pursuing the environmental career path and now has a full-time job in it a couple of years later. And she told me that if she didn't follow me, she probably wouldn't have been on this path. Those kind of moments send chills down my spine because I'm like, yeah, that's exactly it. I want people to feel like they have a space no matter where they come from to do this work and to have their stories told and to empower themselves and their communities to take action. And if I can just be one part and voice in that, for me, that's a success. And I think the ability to have a team that I'm able to fund and continue to grow and expand, like I already feel like in some ways I have achieved a lot of success with what I've done. And I just want to keep having a growth mindset about it that we're going to keep developing and growing and and bringing those resources back to as many people as possible. That is incredible. That is the, the greatest validation. Thank you for sharing that story. Well, Christy, it is such a pleasure speaking with you. I hope we get to do this again sometime soon. And I can't wait to hear more about your progress, the series that you're creating, and where can people find you on social media if they wanted to follow you specifically? Yeah, so people can follow me at Brown Girl Green on all platforms. I'm also Brown Girl Green on YouTube and then the Brown Girl Green podcast. And then if people want to check out the Green Jobs Board, you can follow the Green Jobs Board on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. And check out my website, browngirlgreen.com. Amazing. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode of Inner Wealth. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and that you'll join us next week as we continue to explore all the ways success is being redefined in our ever-changing world. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on your favorite podcast app and follow us on Instagram at Forbes Ignite for more thought-provoking content and opportunities to engage with us. I'm your host, Nicole Kakal. Thanks for joining us.